and thanks so much for joining us today or me today. I uh, got an interesting topic I'll start with, and then as usual, uh, you're free to ask questions about this topic or any topic at all. Uh, the topic today is what is a traction test in terms of craniocervical instability or CCI? You know, this is a common question that's out there, and a lot of patients get these tests. And it's important to know what they're good for and what the limitations of the test results are. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And again, I'll go through a quick uh, lecture on this topic. And then once I'm done with the lecture, uh, we can ask, you guys can ask some questions. So what is a traction test for CCI? Again, this is a common thing. We, we hear a lot uh, that patients get these tests and, and why are they getting them and, and what's this all about? So the concept here is that there's vertical instability. And the idea is that the skull, which in this case is, is represented here on this CT scan, has uh, migrated downward. And this measurement, the BDI, uh, Bayesian Dens Interval, is smaller or has gotten less. And in general, the minimum is about 12 millimeters. And that's the concept. Uh, hence, if that's happened, the idea could be that since the brain uh, or the cerebellum and the brainstem is right here, there may be some compression on those, and that could be causing symptoms for the patient. Now, a traction test for CCI, therefore, is pretty simple, right? You manually pull up on the head, and sometimes that's done manually uh, by the doctor. Or you can insert some bolts, uh, and that's called an invasive traction test. and uh, then pull upwards on the skull. Now, again, why do this? Um, as I said before, you know, you've got folks that have uh, Chiari malformation. Chiari malformation is what we're seeing here, where the cerebellum kind of pushes downward. And the concept is that it's the pressure in here that's causing the problem. So if you pull the skull upwards like that, you will lengthen the whole thing and you'll have more room for this uh, because basically everything will rise up at the same time. So that's the general idea and the concept is you're fixing that vertical instability, so you're increasing that BDI, and the symptoms therefore should go away. Now, the biggest thing you've got to be cognizant or, or thinking about with a traction test is if you get this kind of test and the symptoms are better, uh, you also need to make sure that you don't have what's called a, a false positive test, right? A positive test here would be you get this done, you feel better, your symptoms get better. Let's say your symptom might have been that your right arm wasn't working well, and all of a sudden it starts to work well, or you have headaches, and your headaches are dramatically improved when this is done. Um, the problem is that a false positive would mean that. There's another reason why those symptoms got better, having nothing to do at all with a low BDI or vertical instability or said another way, cranial settling. And that is that when you're pulling weight uh, of the skull off of the neck, the facet joints and spinal nerves are also getting unloaded. Uh, and they're going to be happy too. Right, So if you have a C0-C1 facet joint and that's causing headache and I pull traction, that's going to feel pretty good because now the weight of your skull is no longer pressing on that painful C0-C1 facet. 
or if you've got an irritated spinal nerve, you've probably heard people using traction to treat that spinal nerve because it tends to pull the pressure off the nerve and that feels good. And for instance, their arm works really well in traction, but doesn't work so well outside of traction. So just realize that you have to kind of rule out these things before you can say a traction test is positive or negative. And you also need to realize, and I've talked about this before, that a good deal of Chiari malformations out there are asymptomatic, meaning we've got people walking around with Chiari zeros and Chiari ones that don't know it, they have no symptoms, they probably never will. Uh, so just be careful there, because what you don't want, obviously, is a big surgery when it was really something else that was causing the problem, because then uh, you're not going to get better despite that big risk of a surgery up in here. So in summary, a traction test can definitely be helpful, but just realize that the results are pretty nonspecific and we need to be careful about interpreting those results to make sure that we rule out other things that might get better or cause your symptoms to get better if you have a traction test. So for instance, someone who says, my headaches got better, my first question is gonna be, well, is that coming from the upper neck joints? Because if I pull traction on your head, yeah, your headaches are gonna get better because I'm taking weight off of that. So those are the kind of things you need to be thinking about with a traction test. Okay, so let me stop sharing here and we will go to some questions. Regenix, submitted advanced by Harry Winston. How long after posterior treatment at algo cells should I see results? My issue responds to that treatment. Really, we're talking, uh, Harry, for that kind of treatment at most four to six weeks. So in that time frame for that kind of, of posterior treatment. Uh, Justin, I got no medical traction, but a strong and immediate rebound effect after traction. All my symptoms got much worse for a few hours. Is this a positive indicator for CCI or could a rebound effect from traction indicate some other issue in my neck is causing my symptoms? Yeah, that might be um, more an effect of aggravating things. So let's, let's think about that for a second, Justin. Um, if we try to do traction uh, and you're doing that manually with hands or if you're using a machine to do it, um, with different than if we're putting bolts up here, but you're going to be irritating, for instance, some of the occipital nerves back here and putting pressure on those. And in some patients that can cause occipital neuralgia or cause that to get aggravated. Um, or for example, uh, if there was an irritated nerve or a nerve that with traction got pulled into another structure that could make things worse as well. So I don't know that it's very specific for CCI, but it's definitely something that uh, you need to look further into to figure out what's causing those symptoms. Another concern there could be that you have CCI and it just sort of pulled out those ligaments and, and uh, made things uh, that were aligned, unaligned, et cetera. So hard to say much of anything other than it's a piece of information in a bigger puzzle. Abergenix, uh, been advanced by Sherry Scott. Is there any risk involved in a traction test? I think the risk is pretty minimal, but obviously if you have CCI, uh, depending on how much traction is pulled, there could be some further damage of those ligaments. Uh, I think the concept with uh, the traction test though, in defense of the surgeons that are doing the invasive one, is that if you have CCI and they damage the ligaments, then ultimately they're gonna fuse you anyway. Um, obviously, if you're not planning on fusion, that might be a different story. Uh, how would you perceive a BDI of 2.5? Yeah, that's low for sure. But the big question is, is it causing your symptoms? And that's the hardest part about this world um, that we often talk about here, right? Because we've got things that we can do to rule in or out that certain problems are, are causing your symptoms. 
that are reversible, right? I can do a diagnostic block of the occipital nerve. That doesn't hurt the nerve. It uh, doesn't change any of the, the things going forward that you might consider doing. And that's a reversible uh, test, if you will. But here we're getting into irreversible tests, right? Um, so BDI is 2.5. Um, let's say we do a traction test and it seems to help. Then the next step is decompression and fusion. Um, and that's the only way to determine if your symptoms are coming from that low BDI. And if they're not, then we've done something irreversible. So that's the hard part here about uh, these types of problems. Another, you know, I always tell patients, I, I don't know if your Chiari is causing your symptoms until someone cuts a hole in the back of your skull to see if that helps. And that's the difficulty in saying my BDI is 2.5. Uh, we don't know if that's causing your symptoms. Connor, if the CXA is very high and the atlas is lifted in the posterior side, uh, so uh, let's think about that for a second. So clavoaxial angle, if that's high, would mean that the uh, head is back or the skull is backwards like that. Um, and the atlas is lifted in the posterior side. I'm not quite sure what you mean by lifted in the posterior side, meaning probably the back of the atlas is up maybe against the skull. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I fully understand. Um, would PRP pull the atlas back down? I mean, the biggest problem there is, is going to be not that the atlas is high, right? It's going to be that the skull is back like that. So what would prevent the skull going back like that? Let's, let's see if we can... Uh, uh, I'm going to try to pull up a ligament diagram for you guys here. Hopefully I can do that. Because I want us to think about this here logically so we can say, aha, this is what we probably need to do. Okay, so let's pull up a ligament diagram. And we're going to go ahead and share the screen again. Okay, so uh, we were just talking about the fact that we have a high CXA, which is going to be this angle here. Yeah, you probably can't see that. But basically, it means that the skull is back that way. Then obviously, what that's going to do is it's going to push this part of the skull down, and that's going to close this distance between the atlas and the skull. Now, the real cause of that is not anything back here, but up here, right? Uh, so what's happening is that these ligaments, like the SAOL, the AAOM, uh, in particular, um, aren't doing their job and are allowing the skull to go back that way, which then pushes the back of the skull down towards C1. So the treatment is up here, not back there. Uh, and the only way you can do that treatment would be through PICL because we would that would be an above the atlas anterior treatment. Treating uh, in the back part isn't going to do much at all because the problem is the skull is back that way. And tightening it back here is actually the opposite of what should be done. So... Uh, Good question. I, I, I want people thinking about this stuff because it's it's really critical uh, that we think this way and try to get at what makes the most sense. And I want you guys to understand what these ligaments are and what damage to one might do and et cetera, et cetera. Hi, Dr. Centeno, what are your thoughts on lipogems? Uh, lipogems is fine. It's a uh, micro fat type procedure. 
There is a, a study coming out right now. Uh, it's not yet published, but the author pub, uh, put it on LinkedIn, or at least he put some of the graphs on LinkedIn. That shows that lipogem seems to be equivalent to uh, high dose platelet rich plasma. So it's either lipogems or high dose platelet rich plasma. Obviously, PRP is easier to get because that comes from the blood, whereas lipogems requires a much more invasive liposuction in order to get the stuff that goes in to make the micro fat. So I think that at the end of the day, uh, probably just easier to do PRP. Uh, what if someone has torticollis surgery? Torticollis surgery, that's a new one on me. Usually surgery is not done for torticollis, unless you're talking about them stabilizing C1C2 to try to treat the torticollis. Um, uh, maybe in like CP kids, they might do that, where they might try to cut the sternocleidomastoid, for example. So you'll have to give me some more information on that. Uh, Shanze, uh, what to do with significant muscle tears in the neck after a thrust that are probably partially attached? Yeah, Shanze, I think, I'd, I think we've talked about this one before. I think I'd need more information and look at the MRI and get a sense of which muscles how much they're torn, all of that good stuff. Adina, guided steroid injections can help diagnose upper facet joints issues. Um, you can certainly uh, do that. You don't really need the steroid part um, because the steroid will kill the cartilage in the joint. So you definitely, if you've got a problem in the joint, uh, obviously you don't want to put anything in the joint that might kill the cartilage because that's sort of the problem, right? The cartilage got injured in the joint. And if we're going to put stuff in there, we want to put stuff in there that might help heal the cartilage rather than to kill the cartilage. So we wouldn't want to use steroids, but you certainly could do a guided uh, anesthetic injection in the joint to just numb the joint to see if the symptoms go away. And the symptom or the anesthetic that you would want to use is called ropivacaine. Um, so be careful there, because oftentimes in interventional spine clinics, they will use uh, bupivacaine or marcaine, and that is also toxic to the cartilage. Um, you want them to use ropivacaine, which is usually used in labor and delivery, but it's uh, much more cartilage friendly, and it will numb the joint diagnostically. Well, let's see here. Allison, uh, I had a consult with local regenerative provider and did not feel I was a good candidate as the ACL tendon was so severely torn. My question today would be your opinion on combining the bear implant procedure with polyprogenics. You mentioned the most recent dead on bear not being so great, but maybe bear would help step one. Yeah, so Allison, I think that's a good idea um, because realize that all bear is doing, and just so that everyone catches up to what we're talking about here, we're talking about an ACL tear in the knee. Bear is a surgical implant that tries to uh, connect the two ends, if you will, of uh, a torn ACL that are snapped back and retracted. Uh, the, uh, the bare implant is then put in there and then they put blood in. Now, blood would not be your best thing to stimulate uh, ligament or tendon repair. Um, you would really want to go with either something like platelet plasma or bone marrow concentrate. So that would not be a bad idea to get that done. Now, Allison, um, if you would, let me take a, since I'm the inventor of that procedure, let me take a look at your MRI of the knee. If you can reach out to Carol um, Yates, she's uh, our social media manager, or maybe Carol will reach out to you and she can go ahead and uh, get your MRI files to me. Uh, I don't need the report. The report's not gonna do me any good. I need the actual images. So I could take a quick look at that to make sure that that's an accurate assessment. Again, I'm the guy that invented that procedure. And uh, I just wanna make sure they're giving you uh, uh, an accurate look at that. So I'm happy to take another look at those. But if, for, if it does turn out that there's no way for us to treat it, then I think you've got a good idea there. Uh, Connor, yes, Atlas against the skull. Yes, gotcha, Connor. Uh, Toffee Tube, hey, Dr. Tenner, you diagnosed with CCI. I'm wondering why I feel vertical kind of feeling every time I move my arms. 
Yeah, so read the CCI book. That's that would be a good one to to look at. Um, so if you go to the Centennial Schultz site uh, and go to uh, Cranial Surface Instability. So let me go ahead and share the screen here. Let me pull that out. So if you go to the Centennial Schultz Clinic site, uh, should be able to go to specialty areas, upper cervical, uh, And somewhere in here, you should find the ability, uh, here you go, to download the book. Uh, so that's what you're going to want to do is to download that book uh, and read that. And I'll go all through why, uh, oops, it looked like my, my screen shared there. Sorry, guys. I thought it was sharing. Maybe maybe not. Maybe we stop the screen. Anyway. Uh, there's a, a huge connection between upper neck issues, CCI, and vertigo or dizziness. As far as using your hands are concerned, the uh, NCCI, the scalenes, and the upper traps start trying to stabilize the upper neck. They're not able to do that. Down with your arms down like this, that's all they're doing. When you lift your arms up, these upper traps have to get in on uh, moving your arms, and hence they can't be used to stabilize your neck. Uh, the instability gets worse, your, your dizziness or your vertigo gets worse. Yeah, gotcha, Connor. Uh, surely it wasn't always, it can't always be ligaments that are damaged. Can the disc itself cause instability if there's disc generation through playing sports? Sure, yeah. I mean, the disc is, is almost like a ligament. So, yes, the disc can participate in instability as well. Uh, there are times that we need to treat the disc for instability. In fact, I just uh, recommended doing that in a lumbar patient this week. So the disc is definitely part of that functional spinal unit that can provide stability. In addition, the muscles also provide stability. Uh, so it's one system. Uh, Chris, is there any risk of injury with injecting the sternomanubrial joints and clavicular joints, such as hitting the articular disc or vital organs? Um, yes. Uh, you know, one, you obviously have to have someone who's extremely experienced in treating those areas because uh, you're right. If you were to, for instance, try to treat the sternoclavicular joint here and you went too far into the midline and too deep, you could theoretically end up in the pericardium um, or uh, hitting something you're not supposed to. So just realize that obviously it and experienced hands, uh, that's not going to happen because you've got ultrasound guidance that you're doing that particular procedure under. But you wouldn't want to do it blind without any guidance. And you would certainly not want to have someone do that who's never done it before or hasn't done a lot because uh, there are important structures that are just deep uh, to this area. So you're right. Uh, Connor, could you explain the opposite way around, please, skull lifted posteriorly? I think I did. I did that whole thing. So again, you know, uh, skull goes like this. And the problem is ligaments up here, not back there. So actually tightening ligaments back there would make it worse. Tightening ligaments up here would be the way to go. Uh, Sian, what ligaments are on the left side of the head, like behind the ear? My problem feels like it's coming from there. My I see a muscle spasming and lack of rotation? Uh, lots of things are there uh, in that spot. Uh, so let me just show you all of these here. Let me let me share my screen again. Okay. Uh, so you've got ALR ligament that's there. Uh, not super duper close outside here, uh, would be the, uh, C0, C1 facet joint. Um, so that's close to that spot. The sternocleidomastoid inserts up there. 
Uh, so you can see there, sternocleidomastoid inserting up here. Uh, obviously, there are those facet joints we talked about as well. So uh, C0, C1 is there, uh, et cetera. So uh, lots of structures there uh, to consider. Pia, how effective is a block for compression of cervical nerve root? How long does it last when the skull falls back on the neck? Will CXA get smaller just from this motion? Uh, CXA changes with nodding. Um, and, uh, and so that's why there's a range, usually 130, 135 to 155, 160. Um, and as far as a block for a nerve, yes, that's a good way to see if a nerve is getting irritated. Uh, and one of the ways it can get irritated, obviously, is through compression. Uh, Mustafa, I think I answered that one. Uh, I was only uh, going to air glider from Canada. I was wondering if you do more testing for pouring PSEL. Um, Sure, yeah. I mean, we almost always do a digital motion x-ray. That's one example of, of more testing. Uh, Chris, how can you tell thoracic facet joints may be playing in the spine pain if they appear normal in MRI? Can normal appearing joints be slightly generative below the threshold for positive MRI findings? You know, Chris, uh, best to have someone look at the MRI on the treating side because the problem with radiology reads is they're not really looking for stuff like that. And so they're not going to really talk about stuff like that. So, for instance, I find things all the time uh, that are abnormal, that are clearly degenerative, that fit with the person's symptoms that aren't on MRI reports. That's why I rarely read MRI reports unless I'm looking for something uh, esoteric. But the doctor should be reading the MRI in front of you, with you, showing you where the problems are. And if no doctor has ever done that, then you got to find a new doctor because there is no rationale for doing the work we do uh, for relying on the MRI report. That's that's just not good medicine. Uh, re reading radiologists get to spend 60 seconds to 120 seconds with these images, and they got to get a report out in that time. So obviously, uh, things get missed. Uh, hopefully not big things, but the small things definitely get missed. I see that all the time. Uh, Shanze, I meant to ask if stem cells can help large muscle tears or if PRP is typically used. Uh, muscle tears would either be the poor plasma, uh, if it's in the belly of the muscle, or uh, bone marrow concentrate. Have you ever seen large tears in SCM or splenius muscles? Uh, not large tears, no. Um, so I'd need to look at the MRI or need to look at those under ultrasound to see what, you're, what you mean. Uh, why is insurance dragging its feet to risk covering PRP? What forces are at work here? Um, yeah, Chris, well, that, that continues. Uh, the good news is that through the company I founded, Regenix, um, we have lots and lots of coverage uh, through individual employers who cover all of this stuff. Uh, so we have, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot in the bigger scheme of things, but we've got hundreds of thousands of covered lives uh, where people get full coverage for PRP, bone marrow concentrate, all of that stuff through their employer. Now, as far as PRP it, for larger insurance companies, uh, the good news is the data is there on things like knee osteoarthritis and lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Uh, why are insurance companies dragging their feet? Um, institutional momentum, uh, not wanting to open a Pandora's box, um, lots of things like that. Uh, how do we get coverage at Regenix? We get coverage uh, simply because uh, we go to employers and we say, listen, we can take people from the surgical column, which is more expensive, and move them to the non-surgical column, which is much cheaper. So uh, there's quite a bit in it for the employer. There may be less in it, however, for the insurance company, who doesn't seem to be quite as interested in reducing cost to the employer. Uh, Pia, what is the minimum imaging machine to ensure high quality and safety treating C3 and down? Um, not quite sure what you mean by imaging. If you mean by guidance, um, 
Imaging guidance for the neck needs to be uh, fluoroscopy with the option of doing ultrasound for certain things. Um, ultrasound, in my opinion, is not enough uh, in uh, doing uh, neck injections. So it's just not enough because, for instance, you can't confirm where the stuff is going. For example, uh, there was an injection this week uh, that uh, can rarely get into an important artery. Um, one of the uh, injections did. I was able to easily see that on digital subtraction angiography through uh, a fluoro machine that had a cardiology package, which is all of those in our office. And I was able to say, okay, not going to inject here. I was able to change my position, get out of that important artery, no harm, no foul. Uh, now, had I injected in that artery, that would have been a bad day for everybody. Uh, there's no way I would have seen that under ultrasound. Um, so you just need to realize that if someone's telling you that all they need is ultrasound in the neck, you're not really getting very sophisticated care. You're just getting someone who either doesn't want to spend the money on fluoroscopy or hasn't been trained in how to use it. But you need both uh, available to do a good job, or at least to keep people safe. Uh, Cian, I've seen adults getting the SCM cut in surgery to stop spasming problem with protocolus. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Obviously you would only want to do something like that. Um, if you've ruled out that there's not, uh, upper cervical instability, cause that's a major cause of that kind of torticollis. Um, and if, uh, the patient was completely unresponsive to botulinum toxins, uh, there's a couple on the market and you've tried all of those and they're still on non-functional human. You might consider doing that, although you probably need to fuse C1C2 as well, because you know sternocleidomastoid is a major mover of the neck. So while your neck might come back this way, um, you're not going to be able to turn it to one side. Um, and I don't even know how that would work as you went about your day. So uh, obviously, very, very, very last resort for something like that. Robin, traction really hurt me. Yeah, so that's not uncommon in CCI patients, uh, Robin. Will you add posterior patients to your CCI book? I'm um, not sure what you mean. I think all of that's in there in talking about the uh, what's done posteriorly. Great, thank you. Cian. Can wisdom tooth removal cause issues with the neck? They remove a left wisdom tooth and neck has gone, wor has gone worse since that. You know, it's possible those guys pull some pretty big forces when they're taking out teeth in general. And wisdom teeth are harder to take out. Um, so it's possible. Uh, Hassan, does 18 degree C2 rotation indicate ligament damage always? Uh, I need to know more about what you're talking about there. There's there's more than 50 degrees of C1, C2 rotation. You may be talking about uh, maybe 18 degrees off to the side when uh, the skull is in neutral, um, in which case the answer would be yes. Um, so I need to know a little bit more there. Uh, Connor, I do have hypermobile DS a year ago uh, after I stretched my neck forwards and woke up with a debilitating bobblehead in the last nine months since this happened i've developed laxity all of my entire body where's your pain and mold breaking down connect tissue um, and are there treatments more likely to fail for person treated dealing with something like lyme and mold sickness you know connor i don't know what to say about that as far as mold is concerned um, i don't think we've got any great studies that show that mold can lead to what you're describing, um, or that Lyme disease, for example, can cause CCI. You know, what we do is an autologous transplant. So that's taking whatever it is from point A and putting it in point B. So nothing's going to change about that. Um, with regard to patients who have these diagnoses, I don't think we've looked at that yet. And the problem is that there's not a lot of standard here, meaning that 
for instance, if you go to a board certified rheumatologist, you're unlikely to get these same diagnoses. If you go to a functional medicine doctor, you're more likely to get these uh, these diagnoses. So it's it would be hard to study because, for instance, if we had people who uh, had these diagnoses, how do we know that the other people don't have them as well? They just haven't gotten them yet. Or how do we know uh, whether or not the diagnosis is the same one that a board certif certified rheumatologist would make? So hard to say. Uh, error, I think I have disc issues, C1 to C2, C2, three discs seem to slip off, I guess, front side and back side. What would be the cause of this? It's rapidly worsening, looking left isn't good, either neither is looking down. Uh, there's no disc at, at C1, C2, there is one at C2, three. Um, so if you mean you're unstable at those levels, then that's something that needs to be worked up, obviously, and, and treated if it's continuing to cause disabling problems. Uh, does translational CXA of 27 degrees indicate ligament laxity? Um, I would probably need to know what those numbers were. Um, so uh, what it is in neutral sounds like what you're telling me is that there's a range of 27 degrees from flexion to extension. So I'd need to know what those numbers are, meaning uh, is either number in neutral uh, flexion extension exceed uh, 130 on the low side, uh, 160 on the high side. Uh, Christophe, I had a regenic CD procedure with platelets in six months out. I did not think it worked, but now a year out, I feel better. Is there a possible outcome of the procedure or just natural waxing winning over time? That's a hard one to answer. I would say most people wouldn't take a year to respond. Now, we, I have seen a few people through the years, though, that do seem to take longer to respond. So uh, it's possible. Uh, Cian won't be seeing more videos of results. In fact, I just talked about a research or just talked to a research team about that. They're working on it now and starting to pull that stuff together. When would, will it be ready for release? Probably sometime early summer, something like that. But but they're on it because uh, we had uh, agreed to take another look in the summer and then get that stuff out there. Uh, Mustafa, you diagnosed me from regular MRI. I was wondering if I can do more testing. I think I already answered that one. Uh, Stacy, schedule my upcoming PSEL uh, mid July. Wondering if the fact that chewing clenched my teeth relieved, not increases my pain. Yeah, Stacy. So the 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 jaw mechanism is a secondary stabilizer of the upper cervical spine. So if you do that. It's just another way to stabilize your upper neck. So that makes sense. My chiropractor says my C1 and C2 rotate in opposite directions, but neurosurgeons say that isn't possible. Um, I think we're talking probably about different things here. I think if you're talking to a traditional neurosurgeon uh, who is looking at, should I do an, uh, an upper neck fusion? 99% uh, of the neurosurgeons are going to say uh, not unless you've got a hangman's fracture or something like that or a severe dislocation. Uh, what your chiropractor is talking about is whether or not uh, the C1 and C2 stay aligned or tend to rotate out of place. So they're talking two different languages, and regrettably, uh, it's like someone talking Chinese and German who don't, doesn't know the other language. They're not going to get real far in communication. Connor, it's almost as if since I developed CCI, sent shockwave through my kinetic chain and made my entire body, entire spine unstable and lax. Yeah, so that's certainly possible. Realize that stability requires muscles. So if the muscles get shut down uh, and you have uh, HEDS, your instability is going to go way, way up. Uh, Sienna, I spoke to one stem cells company. They claim that if they inject into the facets near the ligament, the stem cells will go where or nowhere to go and will go to the ligament. 
Yeah, I'd run the other direction. I think they're clueless. Um, the answer is you've got to put cells where they need to go. Um, they're not going to uh, magically get into the ligaments if you don't put them in the ligament. Uh, there's there's no physical way for that to happen. Um, so I think you're just talking to someone who is trying to sell you a very low level procedure um, who can't do the higher level procedure. And hence, you know, it's a little bit like saying, uh, it's a little, a little bit like trying to convince someone that a Chevy Malibu is the equivalent of a, of a Ferrari, you know, F430. I mean, they're, they're different animals entirely. Um, you know, a good salesman though, should be able to come up with all sorts of reasons why he'd want the Chevy Malibu. Um, but no, that doesn't make any sense. You got to inject in the ligament if you want them to go in the ligament. They don't magically jump into the ligament uh, from someplace else. Hassan, I saw an AO, uh, and he said that I have 18 degrees suture after taking Atlas orthogonal. Yeah, so they're talking about a different concept there. They're usually talking about if you keep uh, one uh, steady, then the other is is rotated relative to that without motion. Adina, CXA, neutral 155, flexion 150, extension 177. Um, maybe. Um, you know, we need to look at other things as well, Adina. So, for instance, you could do the same thing with a grab oaks measurement. That's another one to look at to try to see if things are moving around up there. You can also do a digital motion x-ray to, to see if other ligaments are lax. Um, sounds a little suspicious, meaning CXA neutral is a bit high, um, but no one really knows what CXA should be in flexion and what CXA should be in extension in normal patients. We know what CXA should be in neutral. So just be careful there, but certainly additional testing might uh, might make that piece of information important. Uh, again, re remember that all these diagnoses are putting together uh, pieces of information like pieces of a puzzle, right? You got this piece of information and then you've got symptoms and then you've got other tests that all of those things make a picture and the picture either points in the direction of CCI or it doesn't. But one Measurement by itself isn't all that important usually. Connor, uh, it's almost as if since I developed this, yeah, yeah, got that one. Uh, uh, Era, how can I know exactly what's unstable and how it is unstable? Standing up flexion extension, very limited in what it says. Yeah, Era, best treatment if we're talking about the neck and CCI here would be a digital motion x ray. Pia, would PRP help specific with nerve compression 5.6? Understand how injection will help disc. Will this help nerve compression? Yeah, Pia, because I think you're, you're thinking about it uh, all wrong, um, meaning that the biggest problem is not usually nerve compression. The biggest problem is usually uh, that there's instability plus, plus nerve compression and inflammation. So let's see if I can find you an MRI of this guy's neck. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can get this big enough for you guys to see it well. Um, okay, that should work. Let's go. Although this didn't work last time, so hopefully it works this time. Hmm. Having a hard time with screen sharing. Um, apologize, guys. But long story short is uh, what I was going to show you is uh, an MRI of a guy who had a very large disc bulge pressing on nerves. Uh, they wanted to do surgery. Uh, they were chomping at the bit to do surgery. The guy was miserable. We did three cervical platelet-based EDD procedures. Never got the surgery. 
Um, what's the difference? Now his neck is stable before it was unstable. So it was a disbulge plus instability plus inflammation that was making him miserable. Um, so he never needed to have the disc taken out. The disc is fine. He does everything he wants to do. Um, so, uh, so regrettably, that's how the surgeons conceptualize it, how you're conceptualizing it, but it's not real. It's just basically a way to conceptualize it that turns out not to be all that accurate. Um, meaning that we see people all the time who've got huge disc bulges uh, and they got no symptoms, none. Uh, and so how do we explain that? And the model for explaining that uh, goes beyond just talking about the bulge itself. Uh, Mustafa, uh, you're not directly on my question, additional testing for PSO would arrive in your clinic because you're not regular MRI, not patient upright. Those are not available here. Yeah, Mustafa, it'd probably be better if you just reach out to me directly. Uh, so reach out to uh, Carla, my assistant. You should have her information because um, I just need to look at specifically what you're talking about here uh, to see if any additional testing uh, might be needed. Hassan, uh, more this information, yes, I got that one. Uh, Chris, what evidence is there that focusing on extra discal structures such as ligaments helps with DDD pain? Is it purely a matter of philosophy come out of the registry data or is it scientifically vindicated? I think it would be validated. Um, I've been doing it for 20 years, works really, really well. Um, we've published some papers on it. So if you go to PubMed, you can find those uh, under my name, uh, C-E-N-T-E-N-O. Uh, you might also look for Chris Williams on that. Um, uh, but again, you could always inject the disc. That's not difficult to do. That's not a problem. It's just more risk. Uh, so the answer is take the least amount of risk to get the biggest uh, change in the patient. Uh, Connor, I prolotherapy from doctors here in the UK to no benefit after six sessions. He just used 25% dextrose and it wasn't P2G or phenol. For some reason, my laxity did not change in the slightest. Is it a sign to move up to PRP or the immune response metabolic system functionally correctly, correctly even with EDS? Yeah, Connor, I'd need to know so much more. Like, what did this guy inject? Um, did he use guidance when he did the injections? Um, generally, though, in a patient who isn't responding, especially one with EDS, to prolo, in my experience, uh, EDS patients respond the best to bone marrow concentrate as far as tightening is concerned. Um, and some of them will respond to prolo, uh, actually a good chunk, but some of them only to bone marrow concentrate. Um, so it may be a change, but I'd also need to know exactly what he injected and where. Sounds like what he injected was 25% dextrose. The where part is I, I don't know. PF, one only gets one injection in a certain ligament. Is it known if PRP stem cells diffuse along the ligament tissue so it covers a bigger area of the ligament? Um, to a certain extent, yes. You can see that when you inject a ligament under fluoroscopy, you can see how far it will go because you inject contrast and then you chase that with the injectate, PRP or bone marrow concentrate. So you can get a good idea of how far it'll go. Now in some ligaments, it'll spread farther than others. Uh, and in some parts of the body, it'll spread farther than others. But that needs to be determined by looking at uh, a contrast flow pattern under x-ray guidance. And, and then so from there, obviously you can see if you got where it needed to be. And if not, you can go uh, do the ligament uh, that's higher up, for example. So for instance, when we're injecting accessory into ALAR, uh, in some patients, it'll go most of the way up. In other patients, it won't go anywhere near that. Um, and then just did this this week. From the contrast spread pattern on fluoroscopy or x-ray guidance, I was able to easily see that in this particular guy, on the one side, it went all the way up uh, from his accessory into his ALAR. and the other, it didn't make it that far. So I had to go above the atlas on that side to get the upper part of the ALAR. So that's the advantage of using things like contrast spread with fluoroscopy, as you can see where it's going to go. Uh, Stacy, are okay with DMX at New Best Dr. Postal Weight? Absolutely. 
Uh, Hannah, in the beginning of my injury, all my muscles were tight and holding everything in place. After a few years, now my muscles are loose like jelly and turned off. What causes the muscles to do this is something you see in CCI. Um, yeah, I think what happens is you start to get muscle atrophy because the muscles get uh, more overworked than they can handle. So, for example, we'll see that commonly in the upper neck where you can see on MRI that there's uh, stabilizing muscle atrophy. Uh, so I think the muscles are, are getting too overworked. Another thing that can cause that would be nerve irritation, where the nerve going to the muscle has gotten more and more beat up over time, and that shuts down the muscle. Uh, Cian, C2-3 have instability causing the C1. Into, uh, not sure what you mean there, Sandy. you got to give me that one again. Um, I think what you're saying maybe is if C2-3 is unstable, can that affect C1-2? And the answer is yes. Uh, John, digital motion x-ray uh, or DMX is a live moving video x-ray uh, of the neck usually trying to look at ex or look for excessive motion between the bones that and then that's there because the ligaments are loose. Uh, Era, are you aware of any therapies to reactivate neck muscles? I heard there's a therapy that uses a TENS machine but can't find much. Not like that. There are certainly types of physical therapy that can help reactivate neck muscles, but realize that, for example, if you've got a painful facet joint in your neck, the muscles aren't going to turn on because your body turns them off in response to that pain. So you got to do two things. One is you got to get rid of the pain, then you got to work on the muscles. Hannah, also I will follow that up. I feel worse now because I'm more unstable with no muscles helping me. Yeah, Hannah, same same discussion. Cian, should I get surgery for my facial nerve? There's a new technique where they put artificial wrap thingy around the nerves and it works properly like for. Um, yeah, Cian, again, it's all about that ladder of invasiveness that we always talk about, right? Surgery is much, much more invasive than an injection. So you try an injection-based therapy before you go to surgery. Otherwise, you're backwards on the risk equation. So you're, you're taking more risk than you need to. So what's the risk of a surgery around the facial nerve? They can cut the facial nerve um, so that it's dead and you get chronic facial nerve pain worse than you have. Or they can um, mess with other nerves or arteries that are near there. Um, so again, injections come first, surgeries come second, uh, almost with that, I mean, for the kind of stuff we're talking about, without exception. So the answer uh, is injection-based orthobiologics get tried before surgeries, um, because otherwise you're just exposing yourself to more risk than you need to get exposed to. And that's a, that's a, that's a prescription for, for big problems. Uh, Adina, dyspulsion C5-6 and generated upper cervical pain. Usually not, Adina, no. Um, now, what can happen there, uh, and there's a corollary to that, is that if you get a dyspulge at 5-6 and that turns off the local stabilizing muscles, then the upper traps can get involved and try to stabilize, and that can irritate the, um, the back of the neck here and the occipital nerves. But in general, um, no, dysbulges at 5-6 generally don't cause much of the kind of pain you're talking about. It's usually a problem higher up. So that needs to be sussed out by the doctor um, on physical exam. Uh, Chris, to treat a dysbulge with cells, does your procedure use different injection technique than a generic uh, intradiscal injection? Do you have to target the annulus specifically? Um, injected into the nucleus, how do you target the inner surface of the dorsal part of the disc? Yeah, Chris, you can target all of the above, meaning that you can get intradiscal, you can get it intraannular, um, you can do all of those things. Um, and so that needs to be done under x-ray guidance with contrast. So for example, and the guy I just talked about previously, who I saw this week, he's got a very unstable L5 vertebra, extradiscal isn't getting it done. So we're going to go into his discs. We're going to target the anterior, no, actually the anterior longitudinal ligament through the disc, the anterior annulus, the nucleus pulposus, the posterior annulus, and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, so um, uh, is that similar to a generic intradiscal? 
pretty different approach than a generic intradiscal. Generic intradiscal is you just put a, a needle in the middle of the disc, you try to get it in the middle part of the disc, and you call it good. So pretty different. Uh, Debbie, patients with CCI typically have, have to stop exercising and have gained weight. The additional weight something will impede the, sex, the success of PICL. Yeah, Debbie, uh, additional weight is not good for sure. Um, it's not good for all sorts of reasons. It makes procedures more dangerous. It uh, ups their risk. It increases uh, inflammatory cytokines in the body, which increases pain, et cetera. So, you know, one of the things I would definitely recommend is considering a very controlled calorie diet. If you can't exercise, uh, there's that. A uh, little app they have, Noom, for example. You may have seen that. There are other ones online where you can actually input everything that you eat, get a sense of how many calories you're burning in a day, and obviously try to prevent that weight gain uh, would be very, very helpful. Um, also, it's going to mess up your triglycerides and other things that can mess with uh, the success of orthobiologic procedures. Connor, could you explain further how CCI can shut off muscles in the core, transverse abdominal, et cetera? Um, I don't think anyone knows how neck issues directly impact the core other than they're connected, right? We all think of these as separate parts. They're not. They're all one machine. This is the neck part of the spine machine. That's the low back part of the spine machine, the transversus abdominis is part of stabilizing the back part of the spine machine. So if the neck part of the spine machine is having problems, the back part is too, or the low, low lumbar part is as well. Uh, there's actually a study on that, I think done by Hodges, uh, where they looked at folks with chronic neck issues and transverses abdominis. And in most of those patients, after a certain amount of time, the transverses abdominis went offline. Era, is cine radiology a good alternative for DMX? Uh, we don't have access to DMX in Europe. Um, sure, it's possible that someone doing fluoroscopy, which is what we would call it here, or even just static X-ray with the right motions might be able to replicate DMX, where if someone had a big problem, we'd be able to. Um, so if you uh, contact Carla through my office, she can uh, give you some general information that you might be able to give to an imaging center to see what they can do. Um, also in Europe, there's the functional MRI in London, Med Serena, I think it is, uh, that does an excellent job uh, with functional MRI. They do such a detailed functional MRI that uh, there's a reasonable chance you might not need a DMX. Nicole, uh, PICL in February, being in the car really triggers pain. Something I can do to, or I should use to stabilize my neck. Yeah, Nicole, um, some patients use collars when they're in the car. I think that's reasonable if you're just doing that for short periods of time. So I would definitely recommend that if a collar helps you. Uh, I have supine MRIs. Is it possible for you to see the status of my neck muscles, stabilizer muscles? Yeah, era. usually on supine MRIs, we can see the status of the upper neck stabilizing muscles. Let's see on, can PRP fix the nerve compression like go back to normal? Uh, do you see anything on YouTube about it fixing it? I don't want to reduce the symptom. I want to fix it. Um, Sian, I think there's confusion here. The surgeons conceptualize this as nerve compression. Um, it's rarely nerve compression. Um, uh, so I, I don't think you've probably got nerve compression. Uh, I think instead you've got a nerve that's not healthy um, and it may have some scarring around it and nerves can develop scarring around them. So if you use liquid Hutter dissection, you break open the scarring around the nerve uh, through the injection. Uh, but as far as something pressing on it, I think that's mostly fiction. Chris, uh, which part of the neck can shut down all muscles in the body? After I had a neck injury a month later, it felt like I had a stroke with full body weakness, but no actual signs of a stroke. 
Yeah, I think what happens there, Chris, is it's probably more irritation of the dura or the covering of the spinal cord that leads to that type of inhibition rather than a specific compressed nerve. Now, it could also be things like a compressed spinal cord, and you know that would be in the central canal that can also cause that. So you'd need to have someone look at MRIs to see if that's happening. Or could this be vascular like jugular vein compression? Probably having nothing to do with jugular vein compression. Um, nerve compression, uh, either the dura or the spinal cord in the central canal. Nicole, is a DMX required for the second PICL? Usually not, Nicole, uh, mostly because we don't want to expose people unnecessarily to radiation. So if things are going well and you're making interval improvement, there's no reason to repeat that. If for some reason you're not, and we're trying to get a sense of does it make sense to do a second one, then we may ask to repeat it solely to make sure that we're making uh, objective progress um, so that we can say, yeah, it makes sense to do a second one. Tamara, traction has always made me worse. See when goes rogue after any kind of lift the skull. Can you explain why? Sure, Tamara, if you've got instability of the upper neck ligaments, then traction is certainly going to move a lot of stuff around that shouldn't be moved around. Um, it's really just that simple. What diagnostic test would you sh would show scarring around the nerve? Um, yeah, the best diagnostic test for that is an MRI neurogram. It's a very expensive technology. Uh, there's uh, the MRI Neurography Institute is the only place I'd go to. That's the guy that developed the technique. I think his last name is Feldman. And he's the one that reads the films. Now, the films can be done usually locally on the right type of MRI scanner. He gives them the protocol, and then he does the reads. I found he's been very, very accurate in looking for areas of uh, scarring around nerves. Uh, so uh, the Neurography Institute, MR, MR Neurography Institute, um, or MRI Neurography Institute, is a, a good place for that. Uh, Christopher, with all the clinics offering PRP and BMAC coming online in the U.S., do you foresee prices coming down? Probably not. Again, uh, this actually brings up a funny joke. I'm beginning this last couple of months, I've been listening to uh, uh, a comedy streaming channel, and there's always different comedians. They last these things last about three, four, five minutes each, um, and some of them are great, some of them not so much. But this guy came on the other day and said that he saw a billboard for uh, for uh, the, the cheapest LASIK in town. And he brought up that somehow I don't think you want the guy who's charging the least to be messing around with your eyeballs. Uh, that's one of those areas where you're probably not looking for the Walmart price or the deal, meaning that you get what you pay for. Um, so yeah, if some guy buys, buys a little PRP machine and doesn't really know which end is up, he might not charge you much, but uh, you're kind of getting what you pay for there. So uh, I would put that in the same category as discount LASIK. It's one of those things that you just don't want to want to do. Um, we have this sense that maybe medicine should be like Walmart, right? Where you can go in and you can get the same product off the shelf that you might find at a different store for more, you'll find it cheaper at Walmart. The problem is medicine's not like that. Medicine's a little bit more like accounting or uh, legal work. Uh, we all know that there are $1,200 or $2,000 an hour attorneys that are rock stars. Um, and there are $200 an hour attorneys who are probably idiots. Um, so you get what you pay for in medicine. Uh, it's not like a product thing at Walmart. Uh, Hannah, which ligaments are responsible for a high BDI in extension? Uh, that could be all the ligaments that we were just talking about, Hannah. Um, so previously, when you get the video part of this, uh, and, it, and it goes on to Facebook, if you didn't see the beginning, I actually put up a uh, the, the ligaments to look at. And um, those would be the ligaments way up front deep in here. So things like the superficial atlanto-occipital ligament, the AAOL uh, is another one. 
Those are ligaments that can be reached from the front. P.S. It possible to identify the biggest nerve compression with ultrasound? Uh, maybe it would be difficult to do. Um, I know there's some guys out there that are trying to do it and charging a lot of money. Um, probably not all that accurate, probably easier to look at what's happening with C1C2. And if there are vagal type symptoms, then the assumption will be made that there's vagal nerve irritation. But I think it's, it's one of those things where, um, it's hard to image, uh, very different for instance, than carpal tunnel. I can see compression of the median nerve in carpal tunnel, but uh, seeing it in the neck is much, much more complex and much, much more operator dependent. Sure, yeah. Um, Nicole, coming to your clinic was the best investment. I spent so much on treatments, it always made me worse before you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, listen, I can't guarantee we're perfect at all, but I can tell you that we'll spend much, 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 much more time with you than you've ever had spent. And uh, so our, our deal with the patient has always been, uh, you know, you're purchasing our time. Uh, and that time is what usually gets to answers. Um, the problem, I think, with our current medical care system that's insurance based is that the doctors know that they're going to get a certain chunk of money. And all they have to do is to spend X amount of time to get that chunk of money. So we already talked about that, right? We talked about radiology. You know, if you can't read a film and document it and somewhere between one and three minutes per film per MRI, for example, then you really can't make money as a radiologist right now. Uh, so now what's going to happen is you're going to miss all sorts of things. Hopefully you don't miss the big things, but you're going to miss the little things uh, and the little things that might correlate and give incredibly important information about why someone hurts. Uh, so you've got to spend more time than that looking at that MRI. But our medical care system isn't designed like that. Our medical care system is really designed instead to put as many people through as possible in as short a unit time as you can get. And regrettably, stuff gets missed all the time. Um, so again, uh, time is money, money is time, and that's the way the system works. Hannah, I've heard of a high BDI and extension is extremely rare. Is that true? If a high BDI and extension or vertical instability, the vertical instability is something you see in a patient, or is that much more rare? No, Hannah, I would say that a lot of our patients have an element of vertical instability. As far as high BDI and extension, um, again, it's probably going to be more rare than lateral instability. But again, it's those anterior ligaments that we were talking about before. Okay, guys, it's 10 after 2 my time. So that means we've been going now for about an hour and almost an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm going to start um, uh, winding this down. Uh, I really, really appreciate you all being here today. I will be, well, actually, Monday is Memorial Day. So I think I won't be doing this. Uh, I will be doing it on Friday, however. So this coming Friday, I'll be doing this. Uh, Memorial Day, I'm probably going to take off, uh, spend some time with my family. You do as well. And I really appreciate all your great questions. Listen, this is the kind of stuff, these great questions are what generate knowledge and, and knowledge is power um, in the medical care system. So uh, thanks so much for your great questions. You all have a wonderful Memorial Day. And obviously if you're over not in the US, then have a, a great weekend. And I will see you a week from today. Thank you so much.